Yeah, thank you very much. I would like to start my talk thanking the organizers for the invitation. Um, maybe some of you know uh, that I'm an Abinicio person, and maybe uh, Abinicio, with Abinicio theory, you associate density function theory. But Abinicio is a mindset. Abinicio is much bigger than Abinicio than density function theory calculation. The, a very important Abinicio calculation was already done 1845 because Viavier predicted the existence of the Neptune, the mass and the position before it was discovered. And the, in my talk today is I'm predicting or I'm explaining predicting spin models uh, from first principles um, uh, from the first principles theory. Uh, the work was done in collaboration uh, with Yuri Mokousov and uh, Yuri, uh, Hiroshi Katsumoto. They are here. You met them already yesterday. They gave already talks and posters presentations. And it was begun, uh, together with, done with Fabian Lux, who is currently in the US, but well known in Mainz, I guess, and also in Jülich. So spin models, um, I think uh, sp when you write down the spin models, you have some a standard idea about what the spin model looks like. You probably write down a Heisenberg term. If you have a non central symmetric system, you have a, a jalachinsky moria interaction, you have some magnetic anisotropies, and you have a dipolar field. And typically, your uh, spin vectors, uh, your, your spin here is a vector quantity, uh, typically a classical vector. And uh, you have some uh, parameters, and the parameters can be long range if you have a metal with a complicated Fermi surface, or it can be short range if you have an insulator. And then typically you like these models because you want to predict uh, the magnetic structure, you want to calculate the stability of magnetic textures, you want to study the dynamics of systems, the thermodynamics, you want to do classical Monte Carlo, and sometimes you do also a little bit quantum mechanics because you do some linear spin wave theory, you do some holstein primakov transformation, blah, blah, blah. It's also a starting point for, uh, for a micromagnetic model. And if you, can, if you want to relate it to a real material, you typically you try to get these parameters, uh, J, D, K, and S, from a, a first principles calculation. And um, uh, basically, they have, we have many tricks how to get these parameters. For example, you can get these parameters by calculating an energy landscape and fitting your model to this energy landscape. I would like to remind you, though, uh, that if you look very carefully, you have some initial state dependence. When you calculate a parameter, your parameters are from a ferromagnetic state. It might be not valid to describe maybe a block point. Or if you get the uh, uh, <coughs> parameters from a block point configuration, it might be not the right one for a ferromagnetic state. And it's the same uh, if you, for example, we know exactly what to do. So if, you're, for example, if somebody asks me to parameters for a spin wave, <coughs> I calculate completely different parameters than I, if somebody asks me to calculate the parameter close to for calculating a Curie temperature. And uh, the problem is, um, in the last years, we realized that we go to elect more and more uh, electronically, chemically, and structurally more complex solids. And uh, it, here's an example of which was presented by Jura yesterday. And uh, what we realized is the standard model becomes increasingly insufficient. We need more and more interactions, but which ones? And uh, so typically, the situation is that experimentalists come they have their wonderful experiments and say, this is a very complex magnetic state. Please uh, tell me what kind of magnetic state it is and what kind of interaction is, uh, is uh, basically uh, responsible for that. And then, you know, you figure out after some years, it is the up, up, down, down state. And you need an interaction which is not in the literature. So we call that a fierce four spin three side interaction. And, uh, you know, some, many times it is a case by case study um, so some experimentalist comes, crazy magnetic structure, you have to figure out what it is, <clears throat> and you have to introduce a new interaction. Sometimes we are clever enough to find out that certain materials need some uh, um, 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 additional magnetic interaction. For example, if you, have a, uh, if you calculate the energy of a spin wave, and you calculate the energy of a spin wave to one Q vector and the second Q vector, according to Heisenberg model, the spin wave spectrum of Q1 plus Q2 should be the same. But if it's not the case, uh, then you need some higher order interaction. Or, for example, uh, if you uh, look uh, at temperature-dependent results and suddenly your, your uh, parameters, your Heisenberg parameters become temperature-dependent, then you map something higher order into your Heisenberg term. Um, so, so and basically, if you look at the literature in the last years, you have uh, the bi-quadratic exchange, you have the four-spin, three-side interaction, you have the four-spin, four-side interaction, the ring exchange, called ring exchange, 
you have uh, the topological chiral chiral interaction. These are the, all these exchange interactions which have popped up in the last years. And you have a similar a scenario with a spin orbit interaction. For example, you have the chiral biquadratic interaction, the chiral four spin three side interaction. You have the topological spin chiral interaction. I think uh, for an ab initio person, uh, you know, this is too much phenomenology. So this is too much case by case, you know. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, and what these interactions do in general is they make out of a simple spin structure a more complicated spin structure. Say, for example, here you have a single Q structure. And what this higher order uh, do is mode mode coupling. So you, for, you have, for example, a single Q, or this can be combined to a triple Q. And then you realize whether the single Q or the triple Q has a lower energy or not. And this, uh, in this particular gate for manganese copper, this has a, a more uh, energetically more favorable. Uh, so, uh, so for me, the past approach is a little bit unsatisfactory. Uh, for each uh, magnetic structure, you need a new, new PhD student. Uh, it is too much case by case oriented and too ad hoc. Uh, also, new materials may lead to new spin, spin models of interactions we are not aware of. So we need a more systematic approach. And uh, the question is, how can we derive these spin interaction terms more systematically? Well, before I go into the details, I remind you of something you know from your uh, quantum mechanics class. Uh, you have a spin one-half system. You have a spin one-half representation. The spin one-half representations are the, poly the three poly matrices of this spin vector quantity. Uh, these spin uh, poly matrices have some algebra. And now if you do the following thing, you take the square of uh, uh, two uh, spin one-half uh, spins, and then you see it reduces to a, a Heisenberg term. Um, so that means uh, this uh, second, uh, this uh, quadratic, biquadratic term is linear, is not linear independent. So that means, in other words, for a spin one half system, you don't need to write down the biquadratic interaction, it doesn't exist. Uh, so there is no need uh, to write uh, interaction to calculate it. So if you go now to a spin one system, um, so uh, your spin representation is this three by three matrix. You have another algebra, another power expand power algebra. And then you see that the third power term is, uh, can be expanded into a two independent one, which is not a single, which is not a sing, uh, the Heisenberg and the biquadratic one. So and this goes on. Um, so here, uh, you have here for spin one, you have a Heisenberg term, you have a biquadratic interaction, but you have no bicubic interaction. And uh, this goes in principle on forever. So uh, uh, depending on the uh, size of the spin which you have, uh, there is a limited uh, power expansion, uh, independent number of powers. So uh, the same you can do for uh, the chiral interaction. Uh, so basically the question of the power of the chiral interaction S1 uh, cross S2. And uh, if this uh, power is odd, it remains chiral. If the power is even, it becomes non-chiral. And then you see for the spin one uh, representation, the third power is identical to the, the first power. So that means uh, there is not, for spin one half, there is nothing else than d mi. But if you have a spin one system, for example, or a spin two system, or a spin three half system, things are a little bit more complicated. You have the d mi term, you have the uh, chiral biquadratic term, and you have a, another term, uh, I don't know exactly the name of this term because uh, so, far, so far nobody has used it, either forgotten or not needed, a phenomenologically not needed. Um, that is the situation. Uh, and it's good to keep this algebra in mind. Um, we go now further. So now I want to have derived these spin models, you know, once and forever. And uh, I remind you what exchange is. Exchange uh, hinges on the indistinguishability of electrons. So if you exchange the coordinate, mean, coordinate means uh, position and uh, spin coordinates of two electrons, you may change the sign, but the expectation value doesn't change. So these particles are indistinguishable, and therefore uh, any permutation of your wave function will give you the same result. And, uh, and how many permutations you have? You have n factorial permutations. This is, of course, in the solid of huge number. Um, and with this uh, wave function, we, each of these wave function, you can calculate uh, the Coulomb matrix element. The Coulomb matrix element itself is only in real space, so you can integrate 
out the real space and only the spin space remains. And therefore, you can, at the end of the day, you write down your spin Hamiltonian as a Hamiltonian of all possible permutations times this exchange integral, which comes from here, this, uh, times the, uh, the exchange integral, and times uh, a, a number, which is e either plus or minus one, depending on whether the uh, permutation is even or odd. And what permutation means, I uh, write here a very particular one, uh, a permutation between z1 and z2, Basically, you permutate the state one to, uh, and the state two, uh, it looks like this. And now you, it's your personal choice to decide how many electrons I will take into account for all my exchanges, how many sides I would like to change. Do I have only two sides, or three sides, or four sides, or whatever sides, electrons? Uh, you, you can choose, and it gives you uh, additional terms. So for example, if you, and all these permutations are organized in, uh, in groups, so you have a, sy a symmetric group. Um, so you can have a symmetric group of two exchange of electrons, three exchange of electrons, four, five, and so on, and if n, up to n electrons. But uh, the, the, the group elements grow factorial. Let's do a little bit of uh, exercise. So you have, for example, you want to exchange three uh, electrons on three sides. Then, uh, for example, you go to the group S3, which is six factorial. Uh, sorry, three factorial is not the number is six. You have to take out the unitary, uh, uh, unitary one because the unitary one gives you just the Hartree term, which is not very, which is not exchange. And then you have basically five group elements. And uh, what this, uh, what this uh, permutation one, two, three means, for example, you have here the, with the, with the you have an isomorphism to a geometry. Uh, so for example, take this one, two, three as a triangle. Uh, you have the sides one, two, three. You apply the permutation uh, one, two, three on this configuration. And then there is something maybe you, it's interesting to know is that any permutation as difficult as it is, you can always write it as a product of permutation among uh, two, uh, two sides. We call this a transposition. And if you apply then, for example, uh, this one, two, three, can, you can write as three, one times three, two, and this three, two applied uh, to, uh, to this state exchanges these two, and then you exchanges uh, these two, and finally you end up here. That is what this permutation does. Now, and if you go now to four uh, um, uh, states, uh, then you can, uh, you have a four factorial, which is 24 elements and <coughs> minus one, uh, oops, what happens now? Okay, doesn't work. Okay, uh, so basically um, you have, uh, f uh, so basically uh, you, you can organize them uh, into classes and you have basically uh, five classes. And instead of summing over all permutations of all particular group, uh, symorphic group, you can also sum over all classes up to a certain group. So now we are basically finished but we have to do one more thing. We have to represent our permutation operators in the language of spins. Otherwise, we cannot apply it. And uh, then it turns out uh, that uh, each permutation, uh, that a transposition can be expanded into products of uh, Heisenberg terms, Heisenberg type terms, bilinear terms, powers of bilinear terms, depending on the size of the spin S. And that means here for spin one half, this you probably have seen in any textbook already. It is a Heisenberg uh, term. For spin one, uh, the transposition operator is a sum of uh, Heisenberg plus bi quadratic. For spin three half, you go up to the bi cubic term. And if you remember now that any permutation can be represented by this P12, uh, by this transposition, then uh, that is basically on this transparency is all what you need to know. And the rest you can do yourself as a homework problem for your particular spin system. You have to decide what is your spin representation of your system, and you have to decide how, many, how far you want to go in your Hamiltonian. That's all. That is the end of my talk. But uh, I have a few more minutes, and I have exercised this a little bit for you. Uh, I should say Hiroshi did all this. Hiroshi did exercise and has computer codes and Mabel codes and to do all this algebra. Uh, so uh, we first uh, think about uh, spin one half two sides. Two sides is two factorial, two factorial is two. You take out the unitary element, you have exactly one element. This one element I know is this, therefore you get Heisenberg. Now you have uh, three sides. Three
three sides, you have five elements. So three factorial is six, minus one is five. And you, you, therefore, you know exactly your three side Hamiltonian is exactly like this. Um, so I show you this term, these two terms, this is unitary, this is also unitary, to, together it's Hermitian. Um, so you write down your uh, three side permutation operator as a product of two, uh, a product of uh, uh, transposition operators. Um, you take um, uh, the, the P12 and the P213 uh, inverse, you expand uh, this thing here, and you, you see you only get Heisenberg terms. So at the end of the day, three side inter, three, if you take three sides into account, you also get only Heisenberg. Now you go to the uh, symmetric group. You have 24 elements, taking out the first one. Um, th these two we have studied already just in a min minute ago. So these are contributing only to Heisenberg. These two are left. It's the C4, the, uh, the conjugate class C4, and the conjugate class C5. Now uh, I do this, uh, I write down, for example, again, this uh, product here. Uh, for your illumination, you see first a Heisenberg term, and then you see something new. And if you add up everything up, you see for the foresight interaction, you see a Heisenberg, you see the famous ring exchange, which you saw already on one of my transparencies, and you, you see a term which has forgotten before, which is this uh, four spin foresight. This one is related to the C5. And uh, you, now you can, you can do that rather systematically. So let's go to the spin one system. Two sides, two sides is two factorial is two, minus one is one. You know exactly what this uh, looks like. It's exactly the, project, uh, the transposition operator. So this is the two side Heisenberg. Uh, if you go from a, you know, if you generalize this to a crystal, you have basically uh, this form. It's uh, Heisenberg plus bi quadratic. Then uh, you go to this uh, three side. Uh, you have this uh, uh, six minus one elements, and you can work this out, and you see you get the Heisenberg, the bi quadratic, the four spin three side, the six spin three side in the exchange. Sorry, this we haven't taken into account this yet, until now. And uh, so you can also go to the to the four side, uh, uh, spin one four side. Uh, and you have all these uh, permutations, and I show you again C4. And you know, it gets longer and longer because you have here more terms. And that means also you have to, to produce these, uh, these permutation operators, become a product of three transpositions, and each transposition has many terms. Things are getting longer. So you, for example, this term here is a, has a Heisenberg term, a bi quadratic term, a four spin three side, the ring exchange, the six spin three side, the six spin four side, uh, eight spin, four side, and a very interesting one this is the chiral chiral ring exchange. The chiral chiral ring exchange looks like this. This is exactly, uh, you know, you have. Uh, I thought you complained that that was too much for you. Uh, yeah, yeah, but now they are systematic, you know. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, yes. What you see here, uh, if for those people who work, for example, I, I saw yesterday a poster, I mean, uh, so when, for those people who work on a triangular lattice, for example, or a Kagome lattice, uh, or, or B20 crystals, or something like that. You have typically a motif of three atoms, non-coplanar, and these non-coplanar atoms producing a, a topological orbital moment. And you see here, basically what you see is a, a topological orbital moment type of topological orbital moment interaction. It falls out everything automatically. So uh, I don't want to bore you, but um, you can continue now forever. And, uh, but please do it yourself. I only go up to, uh, uh, I only go up to S maybe one, or maybe three half, um, four sides. Um, so I, I would like to say yesterday Hiroshi has an interesting poster, but he says, but he says in his poster, give me an exchange interaction and I give you the corresponding DMI interaction for it. This is hidden in this equation which he has on his poster. So what he did is, he did now on top of all this was I did, he did a first order perturbation, uh, perturbation theory. And in this perturbation theory, he derived a term, which is the, uh, uh, so the commutator of a spin operator and, uh, and due to the spin orbit interaction and uh, your uh, exchange operator. So if you put in now this exchange, your exchange operator you like. For example, the bi quadratic exchange. And what did you, do you get out? The chiral bi quadratic DMI, which was found in a hard work by, this, uh, by, this, uh, Czech, uh, by the Hungarian group in order to explain a very particular experiment. And you, everything falls out automatically. 
And uh, I would say, until now, I formulated everything in a quantum spin model. Of course, we work basically uh, with classical uh, vectors. So what you can do is now uh, simply replace uh, the form which you have, uh, the classical oper uh, the spin operator by a classical vector, and then you get simplifications. Because, for example, this one as a spin operator is very different, but if you, if you make out of it classical vectors, if it falls down to this term. Yeah, uh, with this, I uh, would like to stop, uh, come, come to the end. So I can basically, all these uh, terms which you have here with all these names, with Thaulis and so on, uh, you know, Anderson, you can explain once and for all. And, uh, and also I would like to say, um, you know, we have uh, derived terms which we, uh, we, we haven't, we derived everything which is known and we derive things which are unknown. Uh, systematically. And now, I think, as a little homework problem for Libor, uh, not today, uh, but maybe next year, is now to apply all his group theoretical uh, machinery to extract these terms further for all the magnets. So now they are a little bit too general, uh, but we have exactly, you will tell us, uh, we have exactly a group theoretical arguments for alter magnets. If we apply this further, then you can reduce uh, the, the, the spin models. And this uh, job we have not done. I think uh, you are much more prepared for this than we. And uh, maybe we can collaborate on this. And this is something for the future. Thank you very much.